we're here to talk about pavement rails. Um, my first question, we'll, we'll go down the line, is are pavement rails important for Bitcoin? Um, well, I'd like to turn that question around and ask, would, be, would Bitcoin be useful if you could only do one transaction a day? Would anybody use it? I mean, I do less than that at the moment, so yeah, it would be. You do less than one. Yeah. But there's 300,000 done in a day, so um, yeah, I think payments are, are important. I mean, every transaction, you could argue it's a payment. It's kind of, what do you define as a payment? Is it a large settlement transaction? Is that a payment? Um, um, I think it's clear that for small value transactions that um, Bitcoin's probably not the place you want to do those uh, high volume, low value transactions. Sergey. I think that um, if you, I think many people here, when you tell somebody about, uh, about Bitcoin, yeah, the first instinct, instinctive uh, response is this is a scam. And then the next thing you say is that, no, it's not a scam. Look, I can buy stuff with it, right? And so, I mean, like, end of the day, what, what kind of a money is it we're building here if we can't buy stuff with it? Right? I think it's as simple as that. And all of this, like, exciting decentralized finance and whatnot that is being built, yeah, that's great, but that requires this to be money, <laughs> right? And, and for that, you need to be able to buy stuff. Yeah, I mean, can money be money without all three of the attributes that everybody says makes money money, right? The reason I ask the question is, is the regret we, many of us have when we've spent Bitcoin, whether it's Bitcoin beats a guy or the Vinkelvoss booking a ticket to Venus on a virgin galactic spaceship and when Bitcoin is $800, we're all kind of sometimes given that fear of spending well, Bitcoin. You need, you're not a true hodler then. Because if you're a true hodler, the only thing you would have is Bitcoin, and if you want to eat, you've actually got to spend it. Yeah, true hodler. <laughs> how, how many people uh, haven't sold Bitcoins on an exchange? You know, you never hear those stories about the guy who went on empty gox and sold Bitcoins, right? And it's equivalent. And at uh, end of the day, there is a fixed amount of Bitcoins. So if every time that somebody buys Bitcoin, somebody must sell Bitcoins. And uh, I think that yeah, it's, it's preferable if people use the Bitcoins if they're going to sell yeah, to buy something that stays within the ecosystem yeah, than to just plainly uh, dump it on an exchange. You've all got three very different businesses. You two slightly more similar than maybe Eric's business, but a question for all three of you. What kind of progress has been made uh, for using Bitcoin as a payment rail? What's going right? What's going wrong? Um, so I generally think of it as there's always going to exist an equilibrium in Bitcoin. The more value it becomes, um, more people are using it, the network is going to get congested and the fees are going to go up. If the fees go up too much, people are going to find fewer use cases to be using it for and that naturally corrects it back down into something. And so there's always going to be this kind of, um, this kind of balance there. And I, I think that's fine. What I, what I worry about is and, and maybe Bitcoin's gotten big enough that this doesn't matter now. Um, but what I worry about is, as a Bitcoiner myself, uh, when one of its uses decays as the system grows, that creates a natural constraint or ceiling on its adoption. And um, so far, it doesn't seem that that has hampered Bitcoin adoption generally. Bitcoin is obviously still by far the largest coin and still is doing the most payments around the world of any, any crypto. Um, so, so maybe that, won't, that effect won't be pronounced for a long time. Um, but as someone who's deeply interested in Bitcoin itself and deeply invested in it, uh, that's always been a, a worry of mine is to see that kind of thing. Um, and we've seen it certainly at Shapeshift. Uh, all of our transactions and trades are on chain. So we very much feel that uh, when transactions are happening and the fees get crazy, um, all sorts of problems with the actual customers who are using it emerge. And especially the people who are not used to understanding mining fees and don't realize that they are variable, um, it creates a lot of practical challenges. But so far, it has not been you know, an existential problem for Bitcoin. I guess, Stephen and Sergey, you have different, probably different price points, different average spends for the kind of uh, customers who are using your products. I would guess, Sergey, 
if the network gets busy, the the prices, uh, the fees for making a transaction may become cost prohibitive for products within BitRefill. Is that something that concerns you? And also, do either of you have any kind of trends and statistics about average spends? Sure. So I actually checked uh, in advance of this. Our average on Bitcoin is just under $70 now. Uh, average on Ethereum is 35 something uh, and uh, Litecoin is somewhere similar to that. Yeah, I think this was a concern in, in 2017. Uh, it's not a concern anymore. There's like there's so many different solutions now. Uh, you know, you can just deposit to an account, or you can use Lightning, or you can use Litecoin or Ethereum or whatever. So uh, it's uh, it's it's not all that bad. And plus, like if you look at when the fees actually spike, the fees spike when Bitcoin goes up in price, right? Uh, and, and and so at that time is when people also want to spend a couple of coins. Uh, and and, and uh, the, many plainly don't care about that they they are paying the fees. Yeah, today we you know we we offer so many different options so that you can you can shop with Bitcoin and not care about the fees. But but something that we've noticed is that you know uh, Bitcoiners uh, are, aren't like the fee stuff is not the primary mo motivation for people. Yeah, and a lot of them, like some people do, in, in like in emerging countries and so on, where transaction sizes are really small, yeah, people use some of our other utilities to, to, to drive the costs down. But a lot of people just don't care. And you know, if you don't care, then good on you. Yeah. So um, 90 to 91 percent of uh, BitPay's transactions are, are on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, and the average Bitcoin transaction, the average transaction size is about 900 dollars versus about Bitcoin Cash is around 300. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, going back to the earlier question, what are, the, what are the issues with it as a payment rail? I think privacy is the biggest, um, or the lack of it. Uh, um, I think we need better you know, tools and technologies for uh, maintaining privacy of payments. Um, and you know, it, when you go to companies and tell them that you know this is a great payment method, but by the way, there's a lot of a lot of visibility that people have on that public blockchain. It's, it gives them a little bit of pause, depending on what the nature of the transaction is. You know, a lot of times these are large for us. They're international business-to-business -business settlement type transactions where they're paying suppliers or vendors. Or think think about a company in Brazil that's paying their hosting bill every month. That's a very typical kind of customer that we have. Um, which, by the way, is good. Uh, it, it meant those customers are not sensitive to the price. Uh, they just use the platform to accomplish what they need to accomplish. And so no matter what the price does, they have to make that payment uh, every month to their hosting provider, for example. And what that means is that even when the price was going down in 2018, our volumes actually maintained and actually increased in 2018 over 2017. Um, they didn't increase quite as much as 2017 over 2016, but, um, but that's the first time that we've seen a, 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 an extended bear market and actually our volumes uh, increased during that bear market. So every time I've interfaced with BitPay to make a payment, it always tends to be paying like an invoice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have some, any kind of profile data on the kind of things people are using it for? Because when I talk about a payment route, I tend to think more like e-commerce, yes. less so than settlements. Do you, is it being used much for e-commerce within? It is. About 60% of our transactions are uh, B2C e-commerce type transactions. About 40% are, are B2B, to, uh, B to B, but those are also much bigger in value. Um, but yeah, invoicing, we've got a lot of attorneys, a lot of you know, um, accountants and professional services of all kinds that uh, are signed up on our platform and they just send out an email invoice. It's a very typical transaction. But some of the things you're hearing back from people is that they want more privacy. Uh, you know, we don't hear that directly a lot. I'm anticipating that we are going to hear that a lot. Okay. And I, I do think that's a, a big... Actually, one of the things about Lightning that's interesting and not a lot of people talk about is the privacy aspect. You know, those, um, those transactions that go over the Lightning network aren't going on the chain where they can be, you know, observed. Yeah. So Lightning obviously is being touted as a solution to some of the fees and some of the speed of payments. 
Uh, a lot of people are very excited about Lightning, but also uh, increased privacy that comes with Lightning as well. What is the Lightning strategy for all of your businesses? I mean, for us, we're right now, uh, you know, taking a wait and see approach with it. We want to see it start to develop, and you know, things like your demo earlier uh, are pretty impressive. And uh, um, but yeah, I think we're. Um, you know, we've got a lot on our plate, a lot of priorities. We haven't even uh, put SegWit into the wallet yet. Uh, it's not because we don't want to. Um, it's just other things are competing for priority. Um, so for Lightning, it, I think if we see it develop and, and it stabilizes and it grows uh, and we start to see demand for it from our customers, then we'll add it. I'll come back to Sergey on that. Sorry, I didn't realize you still haven't put SegWit in. It's, we've obviously had SegWit for a long time. Mm -hmm. What's holding it back? It's obviously better for everyone if you do move to SegWit. Is there any reason you're, you've not got it in place yet? Uh, it's just a prioritization. We've got, I mean, we've got a whole laundry list of things that our customers are asking for us and demanding that okay. we do. And so we just, every week we have a priority setting meeting and we just talk about everything that we want to do. And then we kind of, you know, rank them in, in terms of priority. And it just, you know, when the fees weren't as acute as they are right at this moment, it wasn't as big of, a, of an issue. But now, you know, that network cost that we pass along to the customer is our cost to actually move payments through the system, move them to exchanges, sell them. Um, uh, and we have estimated that we could reduce that by about 40% if we implemented SegWin, not in the wallet, but in our uh, back-end operations. Yeah, so now that those fees are rising a little bit, then we're you know, starting to think about prioritizing that. I guess it's a strange one because obviously you said you have customer priorities, but sometimes in this kind of funny Bitcoin world, we have ecosystem responsibilities as well. Um, and I guess you have to kind of balance the priorities for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back onto Lightning, Sergey. Obviously, I know you're doing a lot with Lightning. You had your announcement today. What else is involved in your strategy for Lightning? I've spoken to John quite a bit about what's going on. You guys are pretty optimistic for Lightning, so what's going on there for you guys? Well, I mean, we've, um, we've identified it as uh, the most promising technology when it comes to, uh, to uh, paying for stuff uh, with, uh, with Bitcoin. And, you know, we've had a lot of similar issues like, uh, like I know, the BitPay had with, uh, you know, with overpayments, underpayments, and this and that, and, and so on. And, uh, and all of that just goes away with Lightning. So, uh, from our perspective, Plus, just the fact that it's most likely all all moving bitcoins will move on Lightning, and so we're just trying to make sure to you know we're putting our Bitrefill flag on as much stuff as possible in this upcoming uh, Lightning ecosystem, and uh, that's kind of our strategy: is that we provide utility to people, and uh, we hope that they use our stuff, and obviously we 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 hope that they use our. Uh, our uh, bread and butter products as well. And you're obviously towards the forefront of Lightning. You adopted it. I think you, you did the first Lightning. Remind me. You told yeah, me. we've done the first yeah. everything. I think so you're, it's become you're, a sport. <laughs> so you're facing this front on. What are the unique challenges you face with Lightning that are different from the Bitcoin based chain? I think. Look, there are challenges. It's, it's not all perfect, but there are challenges with good old-fashioned bit, Bitcoin payments as well, yeah, quite serious ones. And like, the, the nature of all of this stuff is that all of this technology is like mm, sort of working, but also uh, a lot of the times not fully working. But we do it anyway, right? And, and uh, it's the same with Lightning. Like, uh, there's a couple of issues, but they're, they're declining. And what we're noticing also is uh, that the, the error modes in Lightning are uh, a lot nicer than the error modes in, in, in regular Bitcoin. So, yeah, we're, you know, we're making a big bet on this. Cool. Eric, you've obviously got a lot of new things coming with Shapeshift. You're very busy at the moment. Have you guys looked at Lightning? Are you looking to do anything with Lightning? Um, when I interviewed uh, Taj, I think it was Taj recently, he talked about Lightning being a very good tool for exchanges. Yeah, probably with us, the, the major impediment to further work in Lightning is that at current fee levels, um, Lightning is only better for very small transactions. So anything over like $100, and certainly up toward $1,000, 
um, just the normal Bitcoin network works pretty well. And so paying three or four or five dollars in fees is not that big of a deal. Certainly there will come a point as the network gets more congested where it makes sense to move uh, engineering resources into lightning work so that people who want to be doing 200 or 500 dollar orders can do so without a 50 dollar fee. Um, and so, you know, similar to BitPay, we need to prioritize that against all the other things that customers are actually asking for. And, um, you know, when, when Bitcoin fees are 50 cents and when they're $50, the development priorities for anyone using Bitcoin will, will inevitably change. Okay. One of the most interesting places we'd all like to get to at some point is whereby we're spending using Bitcoin, we talked about in a circular economy rather than going in and out of fiat each time. What are the things that are holding us, get back, uh, holding us back from reaching the point of being a circular economy? Is it volatility? Is it the fact that people don't want to spend their Bitcoin? Well, what are the things you think are holding this back? We'll start with you, Eric. Um, I think something that really has been under-considered is the, the tax implications. So, um, you know, an average person on the street that wants to buy something for $20 with Bitcoin, they're not going to care if they're not reporting taxes on that. Um, those types of people, in terms of spending power, represent a very tiny amount. The actual amount of spending power generally comes from people, by definition, with more money. Those people tend to, by definition, care more about um, tax consequences. So for those people, uh, it's more of a burden to deal with the financial and tax reporting than the benefit they get by actually using the Bitcoin. So even if they're totally cool with the volatility, even if they totally understand the technology, even if they're okay with a $5 fee on a $50 transaction, um, having to spend you know, a while reporting that and tracking that and the risk of not tracking it correctly actually becomes the real cost. And this is something that doesn't get solved uh, through any kind of technical work. I mean, certain apps could make this kind of reporting better, but this is something that probably needs to be solved on a policy level. Um, Coin Center's doing a good job of trying to push for some kind of de minimis exemption, at least in the US, so that transactions under $600 do not uh, fall subject to capital gains. That would be fantastic. I think that would probably be the biggest encouraging factor for, um, for Bitcoin in actual normal spending. And so, Sergey, think... your, uh, your motto is living on crypto. Right. So uh, j just to talk about the tech stuff, I mean, it, it is a fair point, but it's also a fair point that if you want to you know, change uh, a certain regulation, it, it helps doing things that will make uh, an attacking regulator look silly. Right. So if uh, you know, the government goes after everybody who bought a cup of coffee here for, uh, for five bucks, yeah, they're going to look silly. Right, and so I think it's also like, look, everybody should should do the right thing and and, uh, and report there as as is customary in their country, but but there, I think it's also like as a statement, it, it is kind of important to do these things. It's the same as people who are traders who will submit tax returns that are like you know, you know 40 pages long and they submit it on paper just to send a message. I but think we, it's a similar we way. all understand that in this room, and we will all make political statements like that in this room. The average person, the person at the margin, the person is about to get into crypto, they don't, they don't care about that stuff. And if you, if you combine making a risky political statement with your payment versus just pulling out your credit card, they're always going to choose the, the latter. Well, I mean, it's, it's not, you're comparing the wrong things, right? You're, com you're comparing with the credit card, but what you should be comparing is with the Bitcoin exchange. Right. So if you are somebody who's, uh, you know, made some bit, some crypto gains and, and whatever, you have the option of uh, of selling those coins on an exchange where you get the tax burden and the exchange will report you and all of that. Or you can buy something with it where you're not as much at least uh, reported and you can sort of choose yourself, you know, how you do these things. And if you don't do them, then, you know, <laughs> yeah. so. I think that that's that's more like where where you know we should uh, we should put our focus is that and that's like for us at, at Bitrefill we, we don't see the credit card as the competitor we we see the exchange you know as uh, you know like dump dump if you're gonna dump then dump on Bitrefill instead like it's, it's but this this goes to the point of um, someone who has a bunch of Bitcoin and they have let's say two options where they can sell $100,000 of Bitcoin into fiat, 
and then now whenever they're paying, they don't need to worry about taxes because they had one, one transaction on which they pay tax. Or they keep it in Bitcoin and then periodically buy things um, over the course of a year or two and then have you know, X number of different tax obligations. That burden, that mental burden, becomes part of the cost of using Bitcoin. Sure. And so that's, I think, why a lot of people would rationally, especially if they don't have any ideological beliefs about it, um, would prefer to do the simpler thing instead of the more complicated thing. And I, I, other than a policy change, I don't know how to solve that problem because I want crypto to be used all over the world. I want people to actually be spending Bitcoin on things every day and for that to be common. Um, but this tax issue really is one that's getting in the way of that. Is there any incentive for no coiners to be buying Bitcoin to use for transactions? Or is this really suitable only for people who've been through a cycle, made a bit of money, and not got completely wrecked and suddenly have a reason to spend? Like, what are the use cases for people for Bitcoin as a payment route who've never bought Bitcoin before? Uh, well, in our case, it's, it's that B2B transaction where there's a company. I mean, we've had a lot of customers come to us that are either in the US or Europe, and they tell us, hey, I've never heard of this. You know, I've never heard of you before, but my customer is in uh, Japan, and they, they asked to be able to pay with Bitcoin, and they told me to come talk to you. And those, I, I love those stories because that's, that's where you're, you're seeing companies get real utility out of the payment mechanism. And, uh, and they're adopting and signing up because they get real value and benefit out of it. And it's not just that they're fans of the technology or, or, or whatever. Um, but it's typically a company that just um, is in another country. It's typically an international payment. And there's just, I mean, there, there are some customers that have told us that their only other option besides us takes them 180 days to complete the transaction. That's not hard to compete with. Well, I had the experience when I was out in Japan. I worked with a camera guy for my interview, Mark Carpalis, and we could not find a way for me to pay him from bank to bank. <laughs> we just couldn't make it work. Yeah. So I offered him Bitcoin. Sadly, he, he didn't understand it and trust it. But all my invoices to my clients in the US are all with Bitcoin, so I understand that. Are there any other use cases for people to be using Bitcoin who have never used it before, but it would be better for them than using like a credit card or PayPal? Gambling, porn, online, if they're trying to be private, are really well suited for Bitcoin. Um, so things that need relative privacy, not like must hide from government at all cost privacy, because Bitcoin does not offer that. Um, those use cases still make sense for people to actually buy Bitcoin for that purpose. And then I think the other big one is um, people that are trying to send a payment in to a different country easily. So Bitcoin works great for that, for um, sending money to, to a relative or that kind of use case. Uh, it can make a lot of sense for. It really doesn't make a lot of sense to acquire Bitcoin to spend it in your local area in any way. Um, and for that, it's probably going to take a while for people to start receiving some of their income in Bitcoin, because once you already have Bitcoin, then it absolutely makes sense to be spending it locally. But um, that takes some time, and people already have to have the interest in getting paid in Bitcoin in the first place. So I know this is a Bitcoin conference, but the term Libra has come up a few times. I think everyone's interested slash excited slash nervous about it for different reasons. Personally, I'm more excited than nervous. Do you see Libra as a product that will complement Bitcoin, or do you see it as something that's irrelevant to Bitcoin in terms of payments? I, I think it's very complementary. If now whether they can actually launch it is another question. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually give pretty low odds of it actually going live, but um, uh, but I think it's very very complementary to to Bitcoin because it, it gets people to think about a different way to pay using different tools. They have a broad reach. Uh, and then it gets people asking those questions about, uh, you know, uh, maybe questions they never asked before, like what is money and what's the nature of it? And I think you have, you know, it could make a very good payment currency. Um, and then you have Bitcoin, which is a, a, a censorship resistant, uh, self-sovereign money that uh, as long as you can freely move between them, they'll be very complimentary. I think uh, I'm actually quite excited about it. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that what we're hearing now is not going to be what the end product is. And 
you know, there's a lot of historical analogies of like when Microsoft were building the Microsoft network and this and that and and the and okay, it ended up with Internet Explorer, but yeah, yeah but but it, it probably this is like uh, it looks to me like uh, Facebook is they're they're learning and they're going through a lot of the learnings uh, that that we've already had, uh, you know, on the on the regulatory questions and the technological questions and the the merits of this decentralization and so on. And so, either if it launches in what was presented, uh, and in that case, it will be a, maybe a contender for you know the uh, the, the central uh, the centralized alternative, uh, and then you have Bitcoin, the the, the decentralized. Uh, which is also interesting, or it ends up that it evolves and eventually becomes a, even a, even a Bitcoin strategy on Facebook, which is not entirely unthinkable. It, it really surprised me that they didn't peg it to the dollar. I think everybody was going to assume that they would do that. Um, so, so basically what they announced was a private central bank, uh, which understandably has gotten some of the actual central banks a little anxious. Yeah, and they will probably do a better job. I said back in the green room, um, Everything that gets privatized is usually run better than any public service I tend to find. Um, Eric, have you done any work yet looking whether you will be able to integrate Libra into Shapeshift? Um, is it too early? It's too early because it doesn't exist yet. Um, I would love to integrate it into Shapeshift once it does exist. I think what will be really interesting about Libra is what rules are placed on it. So fundamentally, it's on a relatively decentralized blockchain. Um, but that can be very different when it actually ships versus what it's been reported in sort of the white paper and news. Um, we will see how freely it can move. Does someone need permission actually to integrate it into something? Um, can a customer send a Libra into Shapeshift without us getting authorization from Shapeshift or without the customer getting, or from uh, Facebook or the customer getting that, that authorization? Those will all be really interesting. Um, I'm also very excited that Libra isn't just a one-to-one -one peg with the dollar. One of the follow-on effects of that will be that people will start getting, especially Americans, will start getting somewhat comfortable with a coin that is a little bit volatile versus the dollar, because Libra obviously will not be one dollar every day. It'll be, I don't know how it'll be denominated, but it's going to have some degree of variance. Um, certainly nothing like Bitcoin, but people getting out of that mindset that a dollar is always a dollar um, which it's not, of course, uh, and just realizing that um, it's okay to have an asset that moves, and indeed, there isn't an asset in the world that doesn't move. And for Americans to start seeing that and to get comfortable with that, I think will help them be a little more comfortable with something like Bitcoin, which is also volatile. Plus, they'll, they'll figure out a lot of problems for us, like in a scenario with hostile regulators. I wouldn't mind having uh, Facebook's legal team on our side. And you mentioned the, the tax question. You know what? Well, let's see how Facebook deals with a billion users <laughs> and how they're going to report capital gains on their, on their Libra purchases, right? And wow. so on. So like, I think in the end, whatever launches will probably, by definition, be compliant with American law. Right? Either, either Facebook will change or the law will change, but like, at least we will have a set of rules yeah, that uh, like, yeah, if you copy Facebook standards, then maybe, maybe it's going to be okay. And, and the regular people, they're, they're going to they're gonna see what it is and what it isn't. You know, the first question is going to be, can I use it to buy Bitcoin? Right? Mm -hmm. If yes, then this is going to be the biggest on-ramp to Bitcoin in the world. If no, then people are going to see it for what it is, that it's not entirely free. Yeah, and also, I think it'll be quite exciting to see the Libra Bitcoin chart after about five years. That's going to be a very useful tool to explain people uh, why they need to consider Bitcoin over what is essentially another digital fiat coin, if you ask me. Right. So, it'll be really good for Bitcoin if the uh, Libra Reserve invests in Bitcoin. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've, uh, we've got a minute left. Um, final question. Uh, as quickly as we can. What do you think are the most important things that need to be worked on to improve uh, Bitcoin as a payment rail in the future? Uh, well, Ari mentioned privacy. Um, and for us, a, another big inhibitor is uh, uh, buyer assurances. Some of the you know, buyer protections that they're used to with Visa, MasterCard, um, being able to dispute a transaction and have a, having a dispute mechanism. So I think uh, um, Introducing some of that back into the in, into the mix is is going to be key for adoption. Um, yeah, 
who run it. I, I keep talking about earning coins. You know, I think there's a good billion people in the world that would gladly work for Bitcoin. We just need to figure out how to satisfy that demand. And once those people start earning Bitcoin, it's going to start spinning pretty well. Um, I think that the, the fungibility, which relates to the privacy, is probably the biggest long-term threat to how Bitcoin's model currently works. Um, we have not really seen many black or white lists in any large degree. Um, I think that will happen at some point, and so I'm hoping that the technology can move ahead of that and change before that becomes institutionalized. Um, Bitcoin remains the most heavily surveilled chain of all of them. And um, this, is, this is very sad to see this happen to a coin which, you know, for those of us who got involved very early, one of its, one of its shining features was its privacy. And it's still far more private than something like, um, something like credit cards. But as these tools of surveillance on Bitcoin become more and more entrenched, um, I really worry about its use uh, in, any, in any private way, and that leads to problems with fungibility. Great. Okay, can we have a huge round of applause for our amazing panel?